here we are, back again in the snow. Another load has dropped. So, while we wait for it to melt, here is, without further ado, the second part of the Q&A. How hard can the wind blow at your location? On the peaks we get very strong winds. The highest wind speed ever recorded in Piemonte was actually measured a few dozen miles north of here just before last Christmas. 228 kilometers per hour, which is 141 miles per hour. It was Föhn. Winds that develop from opposing weather systems and pressure differentials on the respective sides of the Alps. Martin's side can get some of it, as you probably remember from his videos. But my side is protected by the ridge that blocks the prevailing winds. So for example 20 years ago, when a storm front eradicated the forest on the hillside I'm facing, the previous owners had forgotten to remove the tablecloth from the table outside the house. When they returned, a few days later, it was still there. There can be gusts, of course, in thunderstorms, when the air may take different paths, but nothing too crazy happens in this particular sheltered spot. How do you get stuff up there? My car does not make it up the road passing my house. I don't have a chimney. So I put my shopping items in a backpack and carry it up in the winter, and in the summer I can take another road from which I carry things down. I don't mind. On occasion, Martin's trip to the valley may coincide with mine, and so I get a doorstep delivery. Building materials I've had delivered to the house, as you can see in the October video, by a special 4x4 mini truck, or I've had the help of a friendly neighbor with a tractor. The frog on the mountain, how did she get there? That is a fair question. It is pretty steep in parts, but nature finds a way, apparently. Are you directing the rainwater to your pond? Do you get more water on your side than Martain on the northwest side? Yes, my rain pipes go into the pond, and the overflow from the pond goes into a covered water reserve from which I gravity feed the drip lines to the greenhouse. But there is no difference on how much water we get on either side of the ridge. The distance is not great enough. But my side is a lot steeper, and thus water runs off quicker. And my side is more perpendicular to the sun, so moisture evaporates faster, while Martain's side is partially angled away from the sun, so that the ground stays moist longer. The grass is therefore, indeed, greener on the other side, for both of these reasons. How do you avoid having your mountain retreat become an idol? Hmm. That is a fair question. How do you avoid anything becoming an idol? By making sure you remind yourself often where the true treasure lies, and that everything here is both a gift from a giver, and only given for a time. Now for a frivolous question. Why do you shave your head but not your face? Is there a symbolism in that or just fraternity with the ancient fathers of the church? I've had a beard for most of my adult life. But when I was getting less and less my money's worth at the hairdresser, if you catch my drift, I decided to attend to things myself in a rather simple fashion. But since it is probably not bad to have a balanced amount of hair on your head, basically just shifted my hairdo to the bottom of my face and added a few inches. So the overall amount of hair is roughly the same as when I was younger. How did you find your place? Hiking? Was it advertised? I found it on the site Immobiliare.it, together with a few others in the area. I used a holiday break to drive here from Austria and check the properties out. In fact, I spent the night on a mattress in my Škoda right across from here, not realizing at the time that I could actually see the house. The next day I climbed the mountain, enjoyed the walk, and on the way back actually looked at the houses that Martin would later buy. But they were too much work for what I intended to use them for, and so I continued on and accidentally passed the owners of the house I ended up buying. It had been on the market for a while, and they gave me a house tour right there and then. The next day I initiated the buying process. The place for me was just perfect, and it had water and electricity, making what was supposed to be a three-year stint realistic. When you work, do you pray at the same time? Prayer is, in essence, raising the mind to God. Any work can and should be accompanied with prayer, understood in this general way to fulfill the call of the gospel to pray without ceasing. I'm not always good at it and get distracted like most people. But there are exercises such as the Jesus Prayer from the East and Western variants 
that aim at the same, and that can be helpful. Do you have trouble with mosquitoes from having a pond? Actually, no. The dragonfly larvae are ferocious and I have little fish that snack on them. I get some mosquitoes from the pond probably, but most come from other places like a, a rain barrel that is not covered somewhere at the neighbors or something similar. Overall, however, mosquitoes are not a big issue up here because there is little standing water on slopes. And I keep a screen door, which also helps against flies. What do you use for filming? I used to work on a Micro Four Thirds system from Panasonic for many years after ditching the original DVX100 of the old filming days. Some recap building footage you saw in this series was from the Panasonics. However, the autofocus made me migrate to Sony at some point because I do theology explainer videos in German and got fed up with the autofocus losing me and hours going to waste re-recording. So I have the Sony A7C, which is a compact full frame, but it is smaller and lighter, so better suited to traveling on foot. That same reason also determined the kind of drone I got. I started with the Mavic Mini, which also supplied all the drone shots you saw in the series. In fact, I long wanted to upgrade, but the Mini just kept working, even after I had to superglue one of its arms after a winter crash some years ago. Only last December, it finally gave up. Uh, the cable connection to the remote went rotten, and after many failed fixes, I jumped two versions and recently got the Mini 4 for the next projects, some of the footage of which you saw in these Q&A videos. I'm somewhat lucky with the technical gear. I don't own it, but I get to use it as a member of an organization I founded with fellow priests some years back. Um, the aim of this organization is to support Catholic media work, and I do qualify. Should we be worried for you about the bump on your left wrist? You? No. Me? Probably not. It appeared in 2019 after I carried a lot of heavy stuff. Uh, it went away after I slipped and fell on the left hand. It returned after some more load carrying. And I did want to have it checked out, but then a certain pandemic hit and made doctor appointments impossible. Then I had other things to do and it was not giving me much trouble. In 2022, my little brother, who is a surgeon, had a look at it. He recommended a specialist, to be sure, but told me it was most likely a ganglion cyst, which is something 3 in 10,000 develop every year. It is not dangerous and may go away or stay without harm. You can, of course, operate it, but uh, even then it may return. So, I just live with it. I would like to know if it is possible for you to identify the birds to go with the beautiful songs, calls, we can hear. There's maybe a dozen or two bird songs that I can accurately ascribe to the respective peak from which they come, but I'm not super knowledgeable. I recommend checking out ebird.org to familiarize yourself with the birds in your area and then to enjoy what nature offers and try to pinpoint the singers. One technical question that puzzled me. How do you manage all these camera positions when you work alone? That is not difficult. You interrupt work and change the place of the camera. And you don't have to do it every few seconds. You film for five minutes maybe and then change. It's in the editing that you then just cut it down to a few seconds. And I also use cropping to get different framings and cuts. That is, I film in 4K, but edit in HD. So I can play with what part of the frame I want to show you. What's the name of the Rocky Mountain with the cross where you've been? I think um, if you mean the video from June, then you're probably referring to Monte Monjoye, a peak which I can see on a clear day from my house, which is actually why I went hiking there. No cattails for the pond? My pond has a liner. I hear that cattails have powerful extensive roots and that may threaten the liner. I do have mini and medium cattail varieties that are less powerful, but as of now they don't take up a lot of space. My pond is only two years old. Would love to see more of how you plant and organize the terraces. How do you know what to plant where? I actually don't plan much. And sometimes I get excited about plants and I get them and then have to figure out where to put them. 
It happened in February again, but with the new garden extension, which is already complete, I managed. There are some permaculture principles on companion planting that I vaguely implement, so I plant nitrogen fixers near to some of the trees, for example. Are you ambidextrous? No boring right-hander here. Practical question, Johannes. Did the insulation work as expected? I think this refers to the floor, and for winter it has been good, but summer is when the real test uh, will happen, because my main concern, as I explained, was always condensation. Summer is four months out, so we'll see, but I'm optimistic. What has gone wrong, or other than you expected? I'm sure I've had my share of fails, uh, not all of which I now remember, but nothing major. There is, however, something I probably did wrong, but the effects are not visible yet. Lacking earth and compost, I filled the raised bed in the greenhouse with tree trunks, at the bottom. That is fine in a vegetable bed, but I realized that this could become an issue as I have small trees growing in there. I can only hope that everything settles before the root system gets extensive down there, because any settling at a later stage might otherwise upset or uh, damage the root system. You may have told us, but now I ask you anyway, have you got any sisters and brothers? Two sisters, one brother. Girl boy, girl boy. I'm the second oldest. How often do you have visitors, because it also takes a lot of time, and does your family visit you once in a while as well? Are you able to visit your family? All of my family has visited at one time or another, except for my little brother, who is a doctor and always busy. As for visitors, there is the occasional hiker and local walker stopping for a chat, and I've had friends and scout troops over. But during the warm season, when I have the use of my neighbor's hut for guests, I'm also typically away a lot. If my life ever quiets down a bit and I'm getting too old for young people like the scouts, then maybe I can welcome visitors for retreats. As for visiting my family, yes, I see them often whenever I'm home in Austria. So I'm not like a cloistered nun or someone who has chosen not to leave an enclosed space. But I guess you can gather that from the series. Do you think you will live as a part-time hermit forever? When you do a shingle roof, the rule of thumb is that the steeper it is, the longer it will last. You'll calculate one year per one degree of incline. Now, I fashioned my roof with an incline of 35 degrees, so I'll be 80 years old by the time it needs to be replaced. Meaning, I'm perfectly happy here and would love to eventually spend my time here, just in Italy. But I'm not my own boss, and so I'll see if my superiors continue to see the value of my time spent here. Where could someone learn about the culture, food and wine, and the flora and fauna in your neck of the woods? One of the great things about Italy is certainly its cuisine, beyond pizza and pasta. But there is no way to learn about it other than to experience it by slowly traveling through this diverse country and asking locals what to order. I, for example, had never heard of bagna cauda, which is a fall dish here in some valleys where you dunk vegetables into a salty fish sauce made from anchovies, similar to a fondue. It is very traditional, yet surprising as the sea is some 70 miles away. But from what I was explained, it came about because people were transporting sea salt to the north, and with it, as a bonus, small salted fish they sold along the way. And they used the mountain roads rather than the planks. I've heard that was done to avoid the heat and therefore the seas, but it may also have avoided tolls and taxes, others say. And so, still today, you find yourself eating fish from the Ligurian coast somewhere in the north. In fact, the first time I heard about it, was before I tasted it. I saw it on a card made by the local artist and illustrator Alessandra Cerotto Parigi. I'll link her Instagram below. She has more food and recipe related designs, as well as designs of local villages and mountains. Wine, of course, is fantastic in this corner of Italy if you check out the Lange and Monferrato region, which I can see from a house beyond the plain. Some world class wines are made there, recognized by names such as Barolo and Barbaresco. But I'm a barbarian from the north, so I tend to prefer Bavarian-style beer. But the Piemonte has also more on offer for small budgets. You can always opt for a glass of Nutella, which 
being a product of Ferrero, hails from the city of Alba, not far from here. For flora and fauna, you best consult books on these topics for the Western and Southern Alps. My question is, can you show us the boundaries of your land via a drone shot? How far beyond the cultivated area can you expand to, and do you have any plans to do so? I have 1.5 acres. The board of my property below the house is the road, and I go all the way up to the top of the ridge, though towards the top the lines are converging and is a mere 20 yards or so wide at the top. I'd love to hear if you know anything about the history of your home before the people who you bought it from. On the house is engraved GM 1893, which stands for the year 1893, and for the man who built it, Matteo Gamba, if I remember right. It is possible that there was a house here before that. In 1818 there was a very rare 5.7 earthquake that damaged a lot of buildings in the region, so it could be that Matteo Gamba built on top of a ruin. In the beginning of the 20th century a family was living up here, but the father of the household was prone to gamble and often lost his wages playing cards. That is what my neighbor Romano recalls from stories told by his father and grandfather. There is still a relative of that branch of the Gamba family alive, and I hope to chat with her soon. But for whatever reason, by the middle of the last century it was abandoned, as Romano recalls from herding goats on the terraces as a boy. In the 80s the roof had long collapsed and trees were growing from the kitchen, but I told that part of the story in the January episode. Was the pond there or did you build it? Is it pretty much self-cleaning? If you watched the 2020 video on my hermitage by Kirsten Dirksen, you can see the slope without the pond. I dug it in December of that year. The pond takes about five years to gain balance, they say. So at the moment, depending on the rainfall, it may suffer more or less from algae, especially because the wind at times blows a lot of leaves into the water in the fall, which then decompose and introduce nutrients. But I don't clean it in any special fashion, and right now, for example, I can see to its bottom, which is about five feet in places. Happy to report that a few days ago a school of 50 fish or so swam happily around. It seems you travel a lot. Are these videos and the earnings they make, like the coffee money, giving you other options in life? I do have some work-related travel, but most of my traveling has to pay for itself, either by being paid for by the people who book me for talks or lectures, or by yielding a story that then hopefully pays for the journey through the book I write about it. For the last eight years, since I've been self-employed, this has somehow worked out. This series is the first substantial YouTube income. Substantial meaning that it certainly paid more than the $10 per episode that I initially expected. That is owed to the fact that a lot more of you than I thought were watching these videos. So, thank you all. Aside from supporting friends in Ukraine, as explained in the beginning, the unsuspected surplus goes towards the 2024 budget. Most of what I do for the church and young people I do for free. Generally, I hope for a yearly net income of $8,000 to maybe $11,000, which after social security and mandatory insurance payments translates to somewhere between $400 and $500 a month. That is not much, but it is enough for me. I do, however, have reserves from my time in Liechtenstein if something big should come up, like car trouble. And it has to be said that a lot of the technical gear and the video equipment, as well as the Adobe software subscription and uh, the licensing for the music and all of this, is provided for by Cut Media, an organization that is supporting Catholic media work. Are you planning to stay more home and write, or do you want to travel more? I would really love to hunker down in 2024, read and write. I have a large academic work of theology I would like to compile and complete. There are projects and scripts to develop, also in view of my hope to do another long walk in 2025. But every year the calendar just fills up. To give you an idea, Easter is around the corner, and while you watched part one of the Q&A, I'd already left for Austria to teach a university block course, give talks and celebrate my father's 70th birthday. Right after Easter, work begins on a book in Italian that is conceived along the lines of One Year in the Life of a Part-Time Hermit and will have the help of an Italian writer, a ghost writer, if you will, to shape things into an adequate form. It is not my idea, but the publishing house wanted to do something more biographical before potentially translating shortened forms of my travel books. 
After these sessions, I leave for Rome for a program on the TV station of the Italian Bishops' Conference and will stay on for a few days to shoot video for an idea I'm developing maybe for this channel. Wink. The day after the crew leaves, I'm heading to Switzerland to speak at the National Catholic World Youth Day for three days before having a break of three days that I will be spending most in Liechtenstein, except for one more or maybe two Jerusalem presentations in a German cinema two hours away after the two shows in February sold out leaving still many people asking for tickets. I don't know what is happening in Immenstadt. That done, the day after the presentation, I'll begin preaching a retreat for young people back in the mountains of Switzerland, the location of which was changed so as to allow me to also give an introductory lecture on Islam for a convention of Catholic medical professionals while the youth do something else for a few hours. And then the summer only begins. In the fall, I might be in the US for two months for an outdoor program with students. So 2024 is pretty full and will see my garden turn into a jungle once again and many of my passion projects linger in limbo. Why did you choose that part of the Italian Alps rather than any of the other very nice places, for example, further north or over in the Dolomites? There is a very short answer. Money. A place in the Dolomites? In my opinion, the most spectacular mountains in the Alps. But it would have added a zero to the price tag at the wrong end of the figure. Same for Austria. There are no affordable places in the Alps outside Italy or France or maybe Slovenia. And the Western Alps are wilder. That said, I did start looking for a property closer to Liechtenstein and Switzerland in the Varese region of Italy. I also found a place that seemed nice, but fortunately I was there on the right day when all the air traffic from Milano Malpensa flew overhead. No thank you. So I ended up here, where I'd fallen in love with Monviso many years ago on a hiking trip. Who taught you your gardening skills? I don't have that many gardening skills. I dabble in permaculture, but not so much for self-reliance, health or yields. But I was looking for a lazy, hands-off way of growing perennials. I think this is how I came across the term permaculture, and it makes a lot of sense. If my thumbs are at all a little green, it is probably because of my mom. You saw her garden in the October episode. My mom was patient even when I excavated and removed 100 bulbs of peonies to erect a crooked wooden shed as an eight-year-old. It was then that I learned that plants need care and don't just pop up. Wondering if that house near you, your neighbor, is for sale or would be considered for sale. It is not for sale and its very kind owner that lets me use it on occasion has a son and a couple of grandchildren, so it is safe to assume that it will remain with the family that also restored it sympathetically four decades ago. And if it ever went on the market, I think I would try to be the first in line to somehow buy it and then use it as a guest house. That would mean I would have to find a clump of gold, but as I said, it will not go on the market. And that's fine. The neighbors I have are great, and they only come up a few times a year for an afternoon. How are your pizza making skills? Perhaps a pizza with a priest episode? I'm Austrian, so if I tooted my horn and proclaimed pizza fame, any sensible Italian would put me in my place. I do make pizza, small diameter, on account of the oven door. And it is comestible, that is, guests have eaten it and either enjoyed it or have feigned enjoyment politely. And that's good enough for me. How many languages do you speak? German is my mother tongue, though the Austrian dialect may challenge a Prussian from the north. English is my second language, but I was never good at languages. My domain was math. So I almost failed English at school in year 10. Right after that, I went to Australia for a year, which was good for my English. But to illustrate how bad my English actually was when I got there, aged 16, here's a short story. I was staying at a packpackers on the Gold Coast doing puppet shows on the street during the day. Aussies call it busking, which I did with due permit from the city council. My roommate was a Kiwi whose aim in life was apparently to lose money gambling and who generally left the room in the evening about the time when I go back. But once he proposed to take me along for joints and to get some girls. I wanted to explain to him that my newfound Christian faith did not jive with this proposed entertainment. So I told him, I'm a Christ. 
This is understandable for a German speaker, where Christ is the word for Christian. But it soon dawned on me, after he gave me a very strange look, that I had just made a rather messianic claim. I am not the anointed one, after all. In school I also learned French for four years, and after some struggle I graduated with high marks, but not because I had turned into a language whiz, but I had learned a way to game the system. On the six most important tests of the school year, we had to write essays or dialogues. So I started learning idioms and phrases that were both stylistically advanced and, because I memorized them, could be inserted without any errors. To give an example, after this brilliant hack, I rarely produced a dialogue in which one of the protagonists would not insist on calling a cat a cat, which is French for calling a spade a spade. Or I even resorted stuffing down a cat into someone's throat, avoir un chat dans la gorge, and thus excusing themselves for having a rough voice. I later repeatedly spent time in France, by the end of which I occasionally would receive compliments on my French even without weaving cats into the conversation. But my older sister, who has actually lived in France, would roll her eyes if she had heard such praise and be right rather than polite. My French later was not helped by learning Italian, which seems to struggle for the same part of my brain. I learned Italian to follow courses while doing my licentiate and doctorate in Lugano, in the Italian part of Switzerland. I also learned Russian for a year to prepare myself for my walk across former Soviet countries on my way to Jerusalem. I could ask for and understand the directions to the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow, but it has been ten years. I'm old now, and I've given up hope to master a Slavic language. If you care for another anecdote on my Russian, from my Jerusalem book, here's an excerpt. I was walking along the busy road near the shore of the Black Sea when a car pulled over. Grigory Ivanovich and his best friend from the time in the Red Army, both of them having been MiG pilots, if I understood correctly, had seen my beard from the window. No joke, it was the beard that had made them stop. When they heard I was a pilgrim, I was immediately invited to Grigory's house. In fact, Grigory got out of his car and insisted on accompanying me on foot while he asked his friend to take the wheel and meet us at the house. It was a humble abode. Inside, the walls were full of pious religious images, an iconostasis of art and kitsch, an expression of deep religiosity. Grigory was a Cossack and proudly showed me his traditional uniform, the sabre and the fur cap. The Cossacks owned their legendary military prowess to dangers presented by the slave-raiding Muslim Krim Tatars. Christian, sometimes even Jewish free cavalry units and militarized farmers were the only ones that dared to inhabit and protect the southern regions of the steppe. Grigori sat down at the piano in the room with the icons and played a melancholy tune. He needed no sheets of music. In their place stood the portrait of the last Tsar, Nicholas II. I then was ordered to the table and served borscht as well as several fermented milk products made by Aprilanka, as the only cow of Grigori's family was named. It was a cheerful gathering with primitive conversation attempts. Towards the end, Grigori's 90-year-old mother joined us. She told of her life with passion, but because my Russian wasn't nearly good enough, I was mainly listening for words I recognized and tried to gather clues from facial expressions. It was basically like throwing a few words at the actors of an improv theatre, who then have to knit a story out of them. My words were tractor, atheist, icon, icon floats down, that's how I interpreted the hand gestures, military and ghetto. What did all of this mean? The reader may come up with his own story. Should someone ask now, the two volumes of my Jerusalem pilgrimage diary are not translated yet. Even the German hardcovers are sold out at the moment after three editions, and I don't think I'll do a fourth. Printing is very expensive at the moment, but we'll see. Where were we? Languages. Any other languages? Greek and Latin were both part of the theology curriculum, but my Greek, which was ancient Greek, serves after years of neglect at best to do some New Testament reading, and my Latin, while being the language of the liturgy I celebrate most often, is very much limited to that. I would not be able, for example, to read the classics or even authors such as Augustine without a major time investment to brush up on what I 
once learned. How many languages does that make? Very few in which I can truly express myself. A few in which I can get a drift, and at least one in which I can try to spin a story with tractors, icons, and atheists. Why have the berries survived the edible rats? You are referring to the dormice, I assume. In truth, I don't know. But if I wanted to speculate, some of the berries are early in the season and survive by ripening before dormice awake after seven months of hibernation, which they extend until there is fruit and nuts available for them. Their most active period is in late summer and fall. Another cause may be that they are too heavy for cane such as raspberries and they avoid the ground when they can. But that is just a guess. Can you explain the painting in your chapel? Hmm, I might do a special on that one at some point. It will be too much to explain here. How did your tomatoes manage to avoid green fly? I don't know if I have green flies. I have normal aphids, but they are not prominent on the tomatoes or anything else but honeysuckle and brassica. Scale insects appear on the citrus, but I do the classic neem oil and soap water with alcohol routine. White flies enjoy the greenhouse this winter because it never froze. Garden slugs are non-issue so far, but I do have the good big brother of the slug, the Limax maximus, which in English is called leopard slug or something from the keelback slug family. These actually prefer dead plant matter and it even goes after the eggs of any problematic slug. All right then, on to some questions on the more philosophical and religious spectrum. So be warned. I would love to know your views on how the world is evolving regarding the artificial intelligence that seems to be moving faster than I care to imagine. Good question. I too am concerned AI will be altering our perception of reality, making it more difficult to discern what is real. Manipulation is already an issue with social media platforms and their algorithms, which drive engagement through mostly negative emotion and polarization, but that only will get more precarious. And things are developing really quickly. A year or so ago, an AI created a video sequence of Will Smith eating spaghetti from nothing but a text prompt and data it found on the internet. And the result was hilariously comic. This year, an AI created a video sequence of a woman walking down a street in Tokyo at night that only pixel peeping and close attention to details reveal is not real. I could hardly believe it when I saw it that it was created from a short text prompt. What this will mean for our discernment of reality in the future is not difficult to imagine. We have evolved to trust our eyes and our perception, at least most of the time. But within a year, this technology will be where you basically can start or influence a war just by leaking fake footage. Manipulation has always happened. Since the first photos were taken or arranged on the battlefields of World War I, they have served for propaganda and manipulation. But this is a different level. It seems almost like the dawn of a new age. I'm not a prophet. I don't know what will happen. And to be honest, I don't worry that much either. Don't forget, I'm a Christian. I don't dream the fragile, open dream of a Star Trek-like future of humanity extending and exploring across universes. From my faith, I'm pretty convinced I know the ending of the story and it looks very different. It features loss of faith, collapse, war, suffering, Christ's return, and the ending of the world. Cheerful, I know. Now, I'm not suggesting I know when that will happen. It could be in a thousand years, or in a hundred thousand years. It could also be next month. The only thing that I will venture to guess is that the atheist scientists that warned the world of the dangers of religion just two decades ago in light of the Islamic terrorism might find that it is science without the ethical guardrails of any religion that will far more likely prove to be the end of us all. For even religious fanatics want the world to continue. But scientists without a conscience may gift us, just by accident, a pandemic that wipes us from the face of the earth. Or they might develop a technology that will be our bane. On a happier note, maybe AI will just continue to help us correct our spelling and be content with that? 
Aside from all that, I want to add a semantic note. I should at least mention that artificial intelligence is not what I would call intelligence. If you define intelligence along the lines of Alan Turing, then yes. Turing called something intelligent if it could trick me into thinking I was dealing with a human. That is the famous Turing test. In that case, Siri and Alexa are already there. They are intelligent. But intelligence in my book is something else. It is understanding, that is, abstracting and relating to the essence of things. And the binary system of computers cannot do this. It can mimic a human in the end result, but it actually does not understand things like a human mind understands things. Because computers really only have chains of on and off, ones and zeros. We don't, or so I would argue. But that goes beyond the scope of this Q&A. If you are interested in that question, you have to look into the philosophy of mind. And if you were looking for a helpful introduction, I would probably recommend Edward Faeser's aptly titled Philosophy of Mind, a Beginner's Guide, which is also available as an audiobook. I recently saw over 500,000 German Catholics had left the church in 2022. I would appreciate your comments on this phenomenon and whether you think it is a loss of the Latin Mass and the new policies or something else. The Catholic Church is, it is fair to say, in a crisis, and it is natural and advisable to go look for causes. Typically, as humans, we prefer singular causes. Some propose it has to do with the abuse scandals, others might be right that the church tax may be a major driving force for such numbers, since if you do not want to pay it, you have to make a formal act of apostasy, which is a mere formality if people have nothing but a weak cultural affiliation with the faith of the fathers. But some have indeed proposed that the summit of Christian life, the liturgy, and the changes there too in the 60s are the chief cause of the crisis. It somehow sounds pious. Sin is always, in the final analysis, a result of turning away from God and proper worship. I would not disagree that our modern liturgies can sometimes hinder rather than further union with God, especially because us priests can be insufferably clerical by shifting the focus on us. But to make liturgy the principal cause would be too simplistic in my view. For one, up until the day the liturgical reforms were implemented, people were celebrating the Latin Mass. Those who made the changes, promulgated and implemented them, brutally at times, had all been raised in and as priests and bishops formed by the Latin Mass. If you think the liturgical reform was an error, the Latin Mass certainly did not protect those responsible from committing it. The Latin Mass is a beautiful expression of our faith, and in the Catholic Church, which comprises 24 sui juris churches under the Pope, not the only legitimate one. But whatever it is, it is not magic. Hence you will see forms of decay and abuse also in communities that rally around the Latin Mass. I have unfortunately witnessed those. Long lace in the end is no protection against heinous sin. In fact, I've sadly found that it can sometimes attract a very unhealthy subculture. Now again, I think the Latin Mass beautiful and theologically rich, so rich that its catechetical value for reverently understanding the Eucharist, for example, would have maybe single-handedly prevented much of the destruction of the faith of Catholics in the real presence. But there is more going on here. And there are many factors that are leading to the current collapse of traditional Catholic cultures. The fact that they are collapsing indicates really that they have been hollow for some time, patched up with some common norms and traditions since left by the wayside by culture being reshaped in another image. One could point to the fact that theological faculties in Germany for decades have not been orthodox. There were good professors here and there, but formation as a whole has been rotten for a long time. How did it become rotten? The whole culture has shifted a long time ago, and you realize it if you read Ratzinger's 1967 Introduction to Christianity. You can go back and further back. You will find currents of futurism and optimism that shaped periods after great trials and also weakness on part of church leaders. You will come to the Enlightenment and liberal Protestantism that went on to infect Catholic thinkers in due course. You will come to the Reformation, individualism, and the modern Cartesian divorce of body and soul. You will come to voluntarism and nominalism proposed by the Franciscan school in the 14th century. 
and your journey to the past would not be over. The church does not exist outside the world, and its members always have to struggle to be not of the world. It is a long story, and our own time is but a chapter, a chapter in which we must aim for the good, have faith in a faithless world, hope for light in darkness, love the sinner while hating sin, ever forgiving the unforgivable. And remind yourself, the church that Christ founded on the rock of St. Peter will continue after the Grand Cathedral of Cologne, sometime in the future, will be sold off. It will continue even after St. Peter's in Rome will have turned to dust and people are dancing on its rubble. The church that Christ founded on the Apostles had neither of these great wonders of art when it began in distant Galilee, and yet it was rich. It will still be rich when all earthly riches have passed, for its treasures do not come to it from this world but from another. So do not be afraid, do not worry about the Germans, pray for them. But then, to quote a saint from nearby Turin, be cheerful, do good, and let the sparrows chirp. The victory we look for has already been won. We are just here to witness it and aid that it conquer all the souls that are humble enough to be exalted until the time is full. How do you think about celibacy and is the love of God enough? The easiest way to look at celibacy would be practical. And that is why it is sometimes done. In Nazi Germany, the largest Christian denomination was Lutheranism. But courageous Protestant opponents to this horrible ideology in Germany were few. People know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and they know him because he is almost the only one. That is not quite true. There were the Scholls and the White Rose, of course, and others. But in the concentration camp of Dachau, that became the place where clerics were locked up, there was only a handful of Protestant pastors, but 2,500 Catholic priests that were imprisoned or killed there. How can that be? Why? Were the Catholics really that much braver? I once had the grace to interview one of the priests that had survived Dachau for a film, and he described to me what had happened in the prison before his transfer to the concentration camp. In the cell next to him happened to be a Protestant minister that had criticized the Nazis. After torturing him for a while, they told him that if he stayed quiet, he could return home to his wife and children. He promised, and his release date was communicated to the family. They were led to the gate, he was led towards the gate, and they could see each other. But seconds before the embrace, they beat him up in front of his family and dragged him back to his cell. He was whimpering. His hope had been crushed. His family was devastated and did not know why or what had happened. A few days later, they let him go and could be certain that the broken man would keep quiet. Attachments and relationships in this world are wonderful and fulfilling, but they also bind you to others. Celibacy gives you freedom to serve the Lord without concerns, which is why St. Paul recommended it. But to really understand celibacy is not only a question of practical concerns in such extreme circumstances. Celibacy is to be a witness to everyone that this world is not everything. It is a spiritual sign. It is to be a sign of faith and hope in the world to come. If I renounce marriage, I do not do so because it is something bad. It is a sacrament in the Catholic Church after all, something that confers grace and sanctifies those that are married. But chosen celibacy is to remind everyone that there is a fruitfulness beyond the grave, that life is not lived just for a few years of joy and pleasure on earth, but for the attainment of an eternal joy, and that sacrifice will often be the road that needs to be taken to reach it. So celibacy is a sign, a fitting sign. It is not necessary for the priesthood as such. As I already mentioned, most of the particular churches of the Catholic Church, Pope and all, ordain married men. But celibacy is also fitting as regarding what the Christian priesthood means in its representation of Christ, which was the topic of another question. As for the love of God being enough, it certainly is. If anything, it is too much. The bottleneck really is not on God's part, but on ours. Being human certainly means to have the capacity for the whole spectrum of human emotions, 
falling in love being one of them. Priests are not asexual, angelic creatures. They are men who have hopefully made a careful and solid choice to order their lives accordingly and prudently. But the same should be true not only for priests, but for anyone. Take, for example, a couple who experiences a crisis. In fact, they may be more at risk to run off with someone else, wounding the other deeply, because maybe they have not taken the time to develop a chaste friendship centered on a common spiritual good while courting each other, but maybe they just skipped right ahead to sex. Now what happens when such a relationship, temporarily or even for a longer period, should be poor in human affections? Say, because one of the partners suffers from a depression, withdraws and cannot bear physical proximity. What do you do then? Abandon the other in the hour of his greatest need? Abandon the other whom you have promised fidelity in good times and in bad? So we all need the love of God to persevere, whether we have chosen celibacy, are happily married, or we find ourselves involuntarily in a situation that provides little human comfort. The priest here too can be a sign to those going through difficult times that the love of God indeed is enough and more. If we are part of God's beautiful creation, why must we believe that we are imperfect and flawed in this creation? I don't think it is something we believe. I think it is something we actually know. If you have ever done anything that was deficient in love owed to God or your neighbor, your imperfection is not a matter of belief, but a matter of fact. And having come to realize this fact, you may ask yourself if it would not be good to strive against it in perfection. But being flawed, I would venture, is not a very revelatory insight, but a very basic one. What would you recommend to someone who has involuntarily strayed from the faith? It is difficult to give a recommendation when you don't know a particular situation. What is involuntarily in that scenario? What does strayed mean? So my general advice is this. What would you do if you strayed involuntarily from a friendship? Is there an issue that needs to be resolved that caused the estrangement? Do you need to simply spend more time to catch up and reacquaint yourself? The good thing about a relationship with God is that while you may walk away, he doesn't. He is right there, right now. All right. I hope I got to almost all questions. If I overlooked anything, I'm sorry. And of course, there were also some general themes in some of the more detailed remarks that I might take up in the future because they may be best explored at some length. Which leaves me with wishing you, if you celebrate Easter according to the Gregorian calendar, a blessed Holy Week and a wonderful feast of the resurrection of our Lord. I also hope that those that have read the book about the Irish pilgrimage have found it worthwhile. If you just now hear about a book, you'll find the link below. Thank you also for all the support and the donations that so many of you have sent. You have thus also generously contributed to the work of my friends in Ukraine, who in six kitchens for the poor so far have served 110,000 meals since the beginning of the war, washed 40 tons of clothes, provided 64 tons of heating material to families robbed of all, and much, much more. Some have asked why I especially support people in Ukraine and not somewhere else. The answer is, I have friends there. All human lives weigh the same, but with friendship comes a tie and responsibility. That is why, while I'm saddened by many other wars going on today, I've involved myself where friends of mine have a claim on me. And with this, I shall pass the mic on to my goddaughter, Marietta. Take care and God bless you. And maybe see you again at some point on this channel. From Thy Bounty Until a few months ago, I had never cried at beauty. I would have regarded it as an inappropriate and sentimental response, and I consider myself to be a level-headed, logical person. However, this past summer, I went on my very first backpacking trip, a 21-day ordeal in the Wyoming Wind River Mountains. Several days into the first week, when we paused for a lunch break, 
our instructor told us to keep our packs on and follow her. She led us off the trail, into the trees, between several sets of boulders, and then out of the trees to a view that changed my life. We found ourselves at the meeting point of two lakes, each surrounded by forested peaks, with the lake on our left pouring down into the one on our right in a series of waterfalls. It had been raining that morning and the mountains were wreathed in clouds. But even as we watched, the wind began to pile the clouds into each other and the sun sent gentle beams through the gaps, which brushed the water and sent it sparkling. I stopped, breathless, at the edge of those lakes and knew as surely as I've ever known anything that it was all there for me. My reaction took me utterly by surprise. I would have expected to feel joy or wonder or gratitude. Instead, to my astonishment, my throat closed up and my eyes began to burn with tears. I was utterly bewildered as I stood there, surrounded by the familiar chatter of my groupmates, staring at a beauty I could never have imagined and grappling with the realization that I was about to cry. I fought it. What an illogical and sentimental thing to do to weep at beauty, I told myself. It must be hormones or exhaustion or sheer feminine idiocy. So I sat down, hugging my knees and desperately trying to retain the last vestiges of my familiar reality as it slipped away down the waterfalls. I fought my reaction as fundamentally irrational and I almost won. But as I teetered on the knife's edge between hot tears and cold logic, my groupmates found their seats, pulled out their lunches, and began to pray the most mundane, mindless prayer I know. They said, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty. From thy bounty. I heard those words as I had never heard them before. They dropped into my heart like the last few drops into an overfull glass. I put my head down on my knees and burst into tears. For me, beauty has always been an impersonal encounter. Whether it be looking at a famous painting or a glorious sunset, my impression is fundamentally the same. They never really have anything to do with me. Other women in history have lovers who shower them with beautiful works of art. To them are dedicated paintings and sonatas and sonnets, but that has never been part of my world. I know those paintings and sonatas and sonnets, but they are not for me. Much less so the beauty of the wilderness, that ferocious, remote, terrifying beauty. The wilderness is beautiful beyond description and utterly indifferent to my existence. That was my opinion until the day I walked to the edge of the mountain lake that was created to make me cry. Why did I cry? I cried at the beauty. I cried because it was an overabundance of beauty such as I had never encountered before. More fundamentally, I cried because it was an overabundance specifically meant for me. That valley and those waterfalls had been formed a millennia ago so that one day a 19-year-old girl would sit there and know she was loved and weep. I knew it had been created for me, which meant I was loved beyond the extremes of any human lover. In that moment, the beauty of the world, expressed both in nature and through human art, was no longer an impersonal force, but a personal gift, a gift born of abundance. It was the kind of gift a lover gives to overwhelm his beloved with the scope, with the bounty of his love. That is the sole purpose of beauty. Beauty exists to overwhelm us with the love of our creator through a direct outpouring of his bounty, a bounty that is directed at us with the same single-minded intention as if we were the only person who existed and were eminently worthy of love. The purpose of beauty 
is to make us weep at the realization that we are loved in a personal way. The mountains and lakes may exist for practical ecological purposes, but they are beautiful because we are loved. Since that day, I have become convinced that the most appropriate reaction to beauty is tears. Joy, wonder, and gratitude all have their place in our encounters with the love of God, but to a certain extent, they can remain impersonal, removed from the love and from the lover. Genuine tears are never impersonal. They are the sign that we have been deeply pierced by an experience of that love. Tears well up from the realization of how bountifully we are loved and how constantly we respond with ignorance and indifference. My thought at the time was that I had reacted irrationally and idiotically, but my heart understood what my head took weeks of thought and writing to reach. My reaction was irrational in that it was more than rational. It pierced the veil between the visible reality and the invisible meaning. When one looks in the face of an abundant, bountiful love, unrecognized and unrequited, there is no reaction more appropriate than weeping. It is a weeping that encompasses both joy and sorrow and surpasses them both. It is a personal response to a personal love.